Thank you so much for joining. Our guest today is Greg Burris. He is a film and cultural theorist whose work focuses on race, media, and emancipatory politics, particularly in the context of US black freedom movement and the Palestinian liberation struggle. He's the author of The Palestinian Idea, Film, Media, and Radical Imagination. He's a, a, a professor at American University of Beirut, just across the street from where I am. He received his PhD uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, his MA from University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, and an MA from Indiana University and a BA from University of Texas at Austin. Greg, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for uh, allowing me to participate. This is a, you know, in these days of COVID, I don't have very many social activities, so this is nice. <laughs> thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. Greg, I think um, a good place to start is on sort of more of a biographical note. Um, can you walk us through a little bit, um, you know, how you were drawn into studying Palestinian film and, you know, Palestinian struggle movement? Yeah, you know, there's not one single thing that really led me on this path. It's a lot of different sources. Um, so, it's, you know, the nutshell version, I'm from East Texas. I'm from a little town called Texarkana. I was raised in a very fundamentalist, kind of right-wing, very white, very Christian environment. And I grew up really hearing about the Middle East, and particularly Israel, through Christian Zionism, through kind of right-wing politics about the region. And I became very, very interested. I started reading books by all the wrong authors, you know, the Thomas Friedmans or the Benjamin Netanyahu's. Um, and I went to university because I wanted to really study it more in depth. Um, and, you know, over the course of my, my 20s, I, I had a complete about face, awakening on every kind of political and religious level you could imagine. Um, and eventually, you know, I, I kept becoming more and more anti-Zionist and pro-Palestine in my politics. But I, I kind of took a break from, I just got kind of po politicized out. And I started to, uh, um, I started to study film. It started out as kind of a hobby of writing film criticism. But of course, I couldn't really drown out the politics. And yeah. so my film criticism became very political. And I started to realize, actually, I came to the conclusion that culture can be more political than traditional sites of politics. Um, and so I started to write very political film criticism, went to the University of California. I want to study film on a serious level. But there weren't very many people doing stuff about the Middle East or Palestine. There, there are a couple of professors, but not a huge number. Um, but there was an amazing black studies department. And as somebody who grew up with the ghost of Jim Crow all around him, I had become convinced that I needed to spend a lot more time not just studying the Middle East, but also studying racial hierarchies in the United States in my own country. And so I enrolled in classes with some professors in the black studies department, notably the late Cedric Robinson. And um, that really influenced me, perhaps more than any other professor I ever had. And I started to see Palestine through his lens, through what he calls a black radical tradition. And that's when I finally realized I thought I had something new to offer Palestine studies, which culminated in this book. Oh, okay. So interesting. I, I don't think I knew that. So your, your entry into studying film through a Palestinian film was through sort of black um, rights movement. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I, I feel like my so understanding of Palestine is colored through understanding race in the United States. Yeah. Strangely, I don't think I really started to understand race in the United States until I was living in the Middle East 15 years ago. And so, but for me, it's, just, it's really hard for me to separate the two. I think about them together. I see them through each other's lens. Um, you know, black radical movement and Palestinian liberation struggle. I, I basically, I set out to study the two things my parents we're most uh, in disagreement with. <laughs> yeah, that happens. <laughs> so you said something that seems to be the, like the thesis of this book, right? Um, the book that just came out, I think last year, it came out or two years ago, right? One year ago, one year. One year ago. ago. So, Although um, it's been a very long year. It's been it has a very, been a very long. long, it's true. Um, the thesis of the book seems to be, um, the under sort of undergirding thesis seems to be that the cultural is political, right? And that's like based off uh, a very famous quote where the personal is political, right? I think the personal political is a first step, but it's not yeah. worth deal with it. Because the problem with the personal political, which is a necessary, I mean, this, this phrase right, comes up with second wave feminism is the acknowledgement that the person doing the cooking and the person cleaning the dishes, that is political. It's, political does not only mean voting, political does not only mean business, 
doesn't only mean legislative. But I don't think that that statement alone is enough. Um, I, I, here's the deal is, especially in hyper political situations, mm -hmm. culture becomes secondary. And even in Palestine studies, you know, oftentimes it's very traditional in its outlook. It, it's a history of um, wars, conflict, ethnic cleansing, negotiations. That's what a lot of traditional political studies of Palestine, that's what they're comprised of. And if you're interested in things like culture, that's like secondary or culture is only interesting insofar as it reflects traditional politics. But I think that's, I think actually, if you're interested not just in resistance, but in emancipatory visions and liberation itself, culture is the place to look. Emancipation, like dreams of freedom, they don't come out of legislation. They come out of poetry. They come out of art, yeah. freedom songs, movies. And so I, I, that's why I say culture is more political than politics itself. Culture can be the place where emancipatory dreams actually are manifest in the world around us, not in the voting booth, not in political speeches by elected leaders, not in the negotiation tables. Yeah, and so in your book you write, culture is not a field that exists separately from po politics proper, rather than, rather culture is the very field in which politics occasionally erupts. Indeed, emancipatory visions of a different world do not usually arise out of elections or legislation. They arise out of culture, out of art, song, and poetry. Yes. and, and so, to add one yeah. more point to that, my friend Stephen Salida, he's got a line yeah. I love. True liberation has never occurred through the legislative maneuvers of civilized men in designer suits. You know, true liberation yeah. comes from other quarters. So if you can sort of talk through why you wanted to write this book and this, this idea of that thesis and how it sort of superimposes in, on the Palestinian context. Yeah. I mean, I felt, you got to keep in mind, I started writing this book in 2012, 2013. Yeah. It just felt like emancipation was in the air. There were so many protests going on. This was pre the apocalypse currently ongoing around us. I felt a lot more hopeful then than I do now. And I think that is in the text. You yeah. can kind of feel this emancipation emancipation in the text i felt as i've already stated that i felt you know of course i'm intimidated to write about palestine i'm not palestinian but on the other hand i felt compelled to i felt like i was raised in lies and i felt like as an american whose tax dollars and whose ideological surroundings supports the settler colonialist project of zionism i felt like i had a duty to add my voice to this struggle in whatever way i could um, and as I said, after I had really delved into black studies, worked with Cedric Robinson, thought really hard about um, black radicalism, not only as resistance against white supremacy, but a place where liberation arises, I felt like there was something I could contribute to the study of Palestine that wasn't being said. Um, and that's, that's really what motivated me to write this book. So um, in the book, the book, folks, talks about many things and um, it talks about film primarily um, and sort of the power of film and the power of media more broadly and even further than that sort of the, pro the, the, the power of imagination and the power of storytelling. Yeah. Um, and you bring up this, you bring up a term called plasticity. Um, can you kind of just define that for the people on that call? What does plastic plasticity mean and why are these two films possible examples of that? Can you just sort of set the table to talk about this a little bit? Well, you have put your finger on probably the most complex theoretical uh, point I make in the book. So it's, it's yeah. not really difficult for me to just do it really quickly. I mean, this is a, so let me just kind of give you the outline of my book so it makes sense. My book yeah. presumes that equality is not just a goal in the future. Yeah. If equality does not exist in the present, then I think it's a pipe dream. And I think when people protest, when people fight for freedom, they are asserting equality. They are saying we are free. And as a result of our freedom, we're going to protest your apartheid laws. We're going to protest your racism. We're going to protest your oppression. So equality already does exist in the present. Revolution isn't creating something new. Revolution is uncovering the forms of equality and liberation that already exist. 
And so yeah. that's what I'm calling the Palestinian idea. It's a term from Edward Said, the famous Palestinian intellectual, the Palestinian idea, which is like this idea of equality and binationalism throughout the whole of Palestine and not some ghetto in just the West Bank or Gaza. Yeah. So I have the assertion that this already exists, and I think culture, in particular film, is a place where we can see it. So every chapter I look at a different media object, and I take this, this kind of thesis about equality and ask a different question about it. So the first couple of chapters, I look at the film Salt of the Sea and When I Saw You by Emery Josir, and I ask if equality already exists in the present, then how does that change our view of Palestinian identity? Um, and that's where I bring up this idea of plasticity. What I'm saying, you know, the, the Zionists always said that the Palestinians never existed. Golda Meir in particular has this famous quote that everybody knows that, you know, the Palestinians have never existed before. And so, I, 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 you know, fighting against Zionism, I, I talk about Palestinian identity, and I try to show, like, what is it? On the one hand, it is a reaction to Zionism. Nobody can deny that certain aspects of Palestinian identity, like memories of the Nakba, for instance, are a response to Zionism. But it's also a creation, which is like intifada, like this, like, violent resistance or creative um, protest or just, you know, the love of one's own culture. But then the third element, which I say is just, which is crucial is like the fact that Palestinian identity isn't set in stone. It isn't in your DNA. It's not necessarily handed down from God. It's something that we can create and change. And it's, it's, it's plastic. It's a term I take from a French philosopher named Catherine Malibu. And it just really, I'm trying to say that it's not set in stone. And as a result, you know, it, it gives a, a a possibility towards liberation. That's my yeah. quick way of trying to explain. No, the, it was interesting because when I first read it, um, for me, and um, you kind of address this in the book, like for me, plastic seems hard and immovable and unchangeable, right? Um, and uh, versus like very flexible. So I actually had to do like a couple double takes of like, wait, hold on, I don't quite get this. But it's a plastic um, explosive. Yeah, exactly. With, and this ties into something that you talked about earlier, where it's this, this idea of change being almost like, um, you know, incremental and the um, very small changes, maybe that's the wrong way of saying it, but basically um, like utopia isn't this fundamental shift, right? Very small uh, changes and reimaginations could actually represent massive uh, have have these like huge impacts. Am I yeah. misunderstanding that? Am I getting that, that wrong? No, I mean what I'm yeah, what I'm saying is like massive revolutionary change. Yeah. Is really just a small thing yeah. that changes everything. So in other words, although I support the right of Palestinians to return, I think true yeah. liberation is actually not some massive project to like bulldoze all the buildings that exist and build new ones and bring people from here and move people there. That's not what liberation is. Liberation is just a small change, which is a radical form of equality. And it yeah. transforms the entire landscape of Palestine or any country for that matter. So it's a small change that, that changes everything. That's, that's what I, that's what I mean. Yeah. Can you, um, I was interested in one of the things that you, you mentioned First of all, I'm curious why you picked these these two films to yeah. illustrate this point. I, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so many different films I could talk about, and I, I was particularly attracted to these films, and when I watched them and rewatched them, I just felt compelled. There was something I wanted to say about them. The director was nice enough to meet me and let me interview her once, and I wanted to promote her work. Um, the most famous Palestinian filmmakers are both men, Elias Suleiman and um, Hani Abu Assad. And I, I like them both. I like one more than the other one, but they're, they're both good. But I, I wanted to promote somebody who probably wasn't getting as much attention as they were. And so I, I wanted to promote Amory Jasser. And uh, that's, that's why I chose her films. Um, yeah. And then My Love Awaits Me by the Sea has a, a, a more... I have a bit more of a story about why I chose that one. If we want to get to it later or now. Yeah. So yeah, I want to get to that later. I want to make one question before we segue into that. Um, 
usually when when I think of sort of uh, filmmaking, um, like powerful filmmaking, right? Um, that has to do with sort of emancipation and um, struggle movements. I usually think of documentaries as a medium, yeah. right? Um, they're the ones who tell the truth, right? But most of the times that I've ever been impacted by film is feature films or not like fiction, right? right. Um, if I think of like the, the, the classic example for me is do the right thing, right? When I watched do the right thing when I was 15 years old, it like completely changed my life. Um, why do you think that that is like you mentioned it in the book slightly like that fiction has maybe more more potency uh, has more creative license like why why do you think that's true yeah i mean if you live in apartheid then how do you conceive of a better world without dabbling into fiction and as long as documentary is like purely pedagogical realist a description of oppression but well, you're not going to find liberation there it's got a useful tool people need to learn the empirical reality but i'm not interested in that i know the empirical reality anybody can go to wikipedia and get the empirical reality i want to think about palestinian liberation or to be honest anywhere in the world if you want to think about liberation it necessarily assumes the structure of fiction thinking of a better yeah. world um, and so that's, yeah. that's why I think fiction is a much more powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah. Martin Luther King had to have a dream, right? He had to have a fiction, fictional dream. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I don't mean to say that, I mean, there's, there's terrible fictions too. You yeah. Know, I sure. think that it's all good, but to be honest, that's why I, I go for fiction. And even the documentary I discussed, My Love Waits Me by, by the Sea, has kind of a fictional element to it. It's not a straight pedagogical documentary. Um, so yeah, I'm a big advocate of fiction and I even want to push it further. I want genre. I want more Palestinian science fiction, Palestinian yeah. horror films. You know, I think they, they can serve a wonderful place in the path towards, uh, liberation. Yeah, we need a, we need a, um, a Palestinian get out. That's what we're looking for. Um, exactly. So yeah, walk me through my love waits by the sea. What do you think it offers your readers? Why was why did it uh, warrant a meditation? I love this film. I just rewatched it about a week ago. Unfortunately, it's I, as far as I know, it's it's difficult to find. I don't know about the like illegally illegal download sites, but it hasn't been released on DVD, and I don't think it's any of the streaming sites. It's a little bit more difficult. But I went to the London Palestine Film Festival a few years ago, and it premiered there. And the director was there, and it just the film really touched me and blew me away. Okay. And as somebody who's not the biggest fan of documentary. I was surprised how much I loved the film because this is a film that is essentially about dreams. The, the question, she, she travels through Palestine, she goes to Syria, she goes to Jordan, she goes to the West Bank, she goes to Jaffa, and she interviews Palestinians and essentially asks them, how do you continue to daydream? What are your daydreams? Um, it's a very utopian film. Um, and so I, I met her, I brought her to California to premiere the film there. I helped her come to AUB to to show the film here. And it's just a, it's just a really beautiful, touching film that um, is, is quite radical. And again, it's a film I wanted to bring attention to because nobody seems to know about it. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question, again, a little bit about biographical stuff. Um, uh -huh. You just mentioned AUB. Um, you, live, you live in Beirut, you know, uh, it's a long way from California, from Texarkana. Uh, you teach Palestinian students, you teach Lebanese students, you have, you know, you're, you're uh, just uh, um, not many kilometers away from the place that you're talking about. How do you feel like your students receive your scholarship? How does that work? What are you learning from your students? And, you know, you've been in Beirut a few years, you've been in the Middle East um, over, over a decade. What have you sort of learned over that time? How has your sort of approach to this work changed over that time? Um, you know, initially I was, I was, even though I was happy to get the job at AUB, I mean, it, before I even got my PhD, I visited Beirut like yeah. 12, 13 years ago, and I had this kind of dream of teaching at AUB. There was no media program at the time, so it was just a fairy tale. Yeah. But then by the time I got my PhD, they had opened the media studies department. It was the first job I applied to, the first job I got interviewed to, and I took it. And even though I was very excited to come here, I was I was a bit nervous. Like, 
what is this white boy going to teach Palestinian students and Lebanese students about the Middle East? But the class, I think, has been wonderful. I've really enjoyed teaching the students here. Uh, it, it's sharpened my insights, and I realize that I also bring a lot of information that's useful to the students here. Um, it, it's, it's been a really, it's, it's been a good experience. One thing that has made me particularly aware of are the different perspectives within, um, within Palestine. For instance, um, we watch a film version of Hassan Kanafani's short story, Return to Haifa. It's a really interesting film. It's from 1982. It was completely financed by the PFLP, filmed in Lebanon. They actually went to uh, Tripoli, and they had all these Palestinians. This is 1982. They showed up wearing the same clothes they had worn 40 years earlier during the Nakba, and they recreated the Nakba for this film. Wow. So we watched that and talk about it. And what's interesting is Kassan Kanafani, as radical a Palestinian as you could possibly imagine, inserts into his text a Holocaust survivor. And even though she is a colonizer, he, in a very complicated way, also sees her as a victim of European anti-Semitism. So it's a very nuanced, it's a very nuanced tell. And we've had a lot of debates about that. I had a student from one of the camps here, and another student who is from the West Bank get into quite a heated debate about the depiction of Israelis in Palestinian film. Can they be depicted as victims? Is it possible to be a victim and a colonizer at the same time? Um, and s seeing those debates, talking about them, um, I think it's definitely sharpened my awareness of how these texts circulate and how they're received. Very cool. Um, I want to talk about the last section of your book and a big part of your scholarship more broadly, which is a term that I'm taking from your book, Black Panther Palestine. Walk me through what that term means to you and um, how those two, you know, those two, those three words are related. Yeah, Black Power Palestine. Yeah. So, Black as Power Palestine. Excuse me. As Black I'm, Power Palestine. As I'm preparing and thinking about this book, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what my angle is. This image you see on the screen right now, it hit me, right? This is a protest in March of 2013 when Barack Obama um, made his first and I believe only state visit to, to Israel, to Tel Aviv and I think Jerusalem, but definitely Tel Aviv. And when that happened, some Palestinians in Hebron staged a demonstration in which they, they took on the icons and the images of the Black Freedom Movement, Rosa Parks, Frederick Douglass, I Have a Dream, music from the Civil Rights Movement, and they desegregated Hebron's segregated streets. Hebron is, it, apart from Gaza, I think Hebron's one of the ugliest faces of the occupation. And it's got segregated streets, sides for Jews, sides for Arabs, and they desegregated it. And then they were arrested almost immediately. And there's pictures of people with MLK masks getting arrested. It's, it's like he got resurrected, wow. just to be promptly arrested yet again. And so as somebody who grew up, as I said, the ghosts of Jim Crow were not hard to find in Texarkana. In my hometown to this day, if you go to downtown, there's an old shell of a bakery from, I think it was built in 1893 or so. And at the top, if you look really carefully, KKK is still etched into the cement. So as somebody who's interested in thinking about white supremacy and in black radicalism, Black Panther Party, Angela Davis, um, the stuff I learned from Cedric Robinson, when I see the ways that these struggles can intersect, I mean, I can't imagine a more inspiring thing for me personally. And so I really delved into the history because it's, it's not new. I mean, you go back to the 60s, there were connections being drawn and, and made between black radicals and Palestinians. Um, and then I, I, I kind of look at the history of that. I complicate it. I think about it. I show different ways in which it's, it's been demonstrated historically and, and today. And, yeah. yeah. I wanted, and throughout my entire book, even though it, there's only one chapter that's specifically about black Palestinian solidarity, the entire book, I'm using black radical thought, whether it's Cedric Robinson or James Baldwin or Huey Newton from the Black Panther Party or Asada Shakur, because I wanted not just to document black Palestinian solidarity, but take it a step further and ask what does Palestinian film and culture look like if we view it through the lens of black radical thought. And so I think my book is a step in that direction. Do you feel like um, through your conversations with filmmakers, do you feel like there are filmmakers um, 
or artists communicating with, with each other through their art? Are there um, filmmakers who are looking at the films coming out of, you know, the, the black rights movement in the States saying, okay, this is how, you know, art was utilized uh, to reimagine it, uh, um, imagine liberation. Is, is there sort of, is art mimic it, uh, mimic, mimicking each other across the, trans like transnationally? Art certainly is. It usually is the yeah. form of music or creative demonstrations or poetry, not film. Yeah. But even in film, there are some very interesting examples. Danny Glover, one of my favorite people, oh, yeah. has produced several Palestinian films. In the latest film that just came out by Elias Suleiman, if any of you have seen Elias Suleiman films, he's done four feature films. He stars in them and he's silent the entire time. He never says a word, except in the latest one. In it, he plays this Palestinian character. And at one point he goes to New York City and he has a black taxi driver ask him where he's from. And for the first time in any of his films, he says, I am Palestinian. And I think it's a very significant moment. And it's also significant, it happens in conversation with the black cab driver from New York. There's, there's something going on there that I haven't fully worked out yet. Um, even the, but even the Anne-Marie Jassir, when, she, was, when she, she got a grant to write the script for uh, When I Saw You, mm -hmm. Paul Robeson Foundation. So it's just like, there are even these connections at the film level. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I want to open up to the questions in a second. Before we do, let's do this quick uh, Q&A. Um, so what are you reading or watching right now? You know, right, lately I've been, I, I've been going back through a lot of, uh, of black literature from the 60s. I just read Angela Davis's autobiography, and then I've been kind of going through and reading the stuff by James Baldwin that I, I've missed. And I just picked up um, the prison letters of a man named George Jackson. He was a political prisoner, essentially, who was assassinated by cops. Um, so I just opened that up uh, this week. So that's yeah, what he's he he American. Yeah, he's American. These are black Americans. And I, I always find that era and that literature to be like a very inspired. Like sometimes when I read scholars, it intimidates me and it just I don't, it doesn't really make me want to write. When I read Angela Davis or George Jackson or James Baldwin, it makes me excited about writing again. So yeah. that's why I'm kind, of do, I'm kind of going back through some of this stuff. That's how I feel about stand-up comics. <laughs> okay, um, good. Okay, let's, uh, who would you shadow for a day, past or present? There's a character who I wish I had met and I would love to have shadowed him. His name is Elan Halevi. He's dead. He was born in France. He was Jewish. He became friends with all of the black Americans who lived there, like James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Then he moved to Israel and realized he didn't like it. So then he moved to the West Bank and joined the PLO and became one of Yasser Arafat's top aides. That is a man I would like to shadow for a day. How would, <laughs> it's not like you want to shadow him for a lifetime. What <laughs> is, how, do you pronounce, how do you spell his name? Ilan Halevi, H-A-L-E-V-I. From James Baldwin to Yasser Arafat, that is a biography that needs to be written. Huh, interesting, okay, very interesting. Um, what do most people misunderstand about your work or your line of work? Every time anybody asks me what I do, I say I teach film, they think I'm a filmmaker. And I have, I, not only am I not a filmmaker, I have no interest in being one. I want to write about mm. films. I like film criticism. I like literature. I like writing. And that's what I want to do, not make films. So just as a, a, a trailer, um, who, who are your favorite film critics? Robin Wood. He's now passed away, but Robin Wood changed my life. Robin Wood was a gay, feminist, Marxist, British film critic in the 60s, 70s. He would write about Alfred Hitchcock, or even horror films like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But no matter what he wrote about, he always get, he, first of all, he's a beautiful writer. And second of all, he would always make you see patriarchy in ways you didn't realize. He'd make you see racism, capitalism, consumerism. I think he opened my eyes to politics almost more than yeah. anybody else. It's like, a, do you ever read Wesley Morris? No. Oh, I love Wesley Morris, he's amazing. Really good. Um, whose work do you admire and are or are inspired by? My old professor, Cedric Robinson. Um, Cedric Robinson was definitely the best professor I ever had. 
Um, he's one of the three most important theoretical figures in my book. And as I go forward, I'm, I'm certain that everything I ever write will be touched by his, his knowledge and his, his, his insight. He's, he was very interesting because, I mean, as a young man, he, he met Malcolm X. He wrote this just breathtakingly epic book called Black Marxism that is both a critique of black nationalism and Marxism. Most people don't realize because they don't bother to read it. But in class, see, if you read him, you never realize how amazing he is. In class, he would take you to the verge of tears talking about oppression, and then he would crack a joke and bring you right back into, like, you know, laughter. So I, I, I think about him not only in my writing, but also in my teaching. Out of curiosity, who are the other two important thinkers that sort of undergird your book? You so said there's, the top there's three, and they're men. There's a lot of women in my book, but the three most important theorists are all men, and I feel bad about that, and I need to, I need to, I need to change that in my next book. But it's Edward Said. Jacques Rancière, uh, a French theorist who yeah. really thought of quality. He really opened my eyes, think about quality, and Cedric Robinson. Great. Okay, Greg, this is a really, really fantastic. We have two questions coming up. I'm sure we'll have more to start with. Ahmad, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, guys. Hi, Hello. Hi Greg. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. Sure. Was, uh, very inspiring. And Mikey, thank you, as always for everything. Um, so my question is very general. And I think you said it in the beginning, like everything at the end is like related to politics. You know, like it always is popping up. So my question is, how can the, BL, the Black Lives Matter movement in the US significantly influence uh, US foreign policy towards Palestine and US uh, public opinion, which is to an extent changing towards the uh, Israeli occupation. So what's like, how can that happen? How can they work? And how is it effective moving, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, this is a question that I do not have an answer for you. I, yeah. I don't have a I don't have a recipe about how they do it. All I can say is yeah. they're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and it might yeah. be a very crooked road. I mean, it might what they're doing could create a huge right wing backlash for a while. Mm -hmm. That often happens when you have feminism in the 60s and 70s next thing you know, have reagan in the 80s so it might create a backlash a white supremacist backlash we're already seeing it actually mm -hmm. but as years goes by i think what they're doing w will definitely change not only national race relations and politics in the united states but also the way foreign policy is conducted and that's that's essential about black lives matter i mean it's not just a domestic movement they have it's become global and there have been like anti-colonialist or decolonialist anti-apartheid voices from within. So um, I don't have a simple answer for you on that, but I I'm watching it with the same popcorn as you are and, and very, very excited about what's taking place. Wait, Akia, you want to un uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, it's Asya. And Asya, thank you thanks. so much. <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, hello, Professor. <laughs> it's nice to be seeing you again. Um, my question is like, it's derived from, because like your book, it talks about parallels drawn between the Black Lives Movement, or at least that's what it's called today, and the Palestinian identity, if we're going to call it also a movement, an intifada. So if we could also like, if we're characterizing movements, cultural movements as being, um, they're present, like the identity is present. We're not saying that they're creating something for the future. And if I'm trying to tie it with a term that's, we took it in class about um, by theorist Judith uh, Butler about being like feminist movement, being performative, as in the actions today will give something in the future. So how, how would you like criticize or maybe um, tie like the feminist movement and the act of like the Palestinian identity movement how do they align is there a sort of way to put them like in a sense together that's an easy question <laughs> that's a very difficult question I'll do my best to answer it if I understand you correctly first of all you are quite right to suggest that Judith Butler's notion of performativity does parallel my own ideas about identity more broadly. That identity isn't set in stone, it's not in your DNA, it's not handed upon you at a high, it's changing constantly, 
and it's very much through our performance, whether that identity is white or black or Palestinian or anything else. So, so there is like some parallel there. I haven't thought much more about that, but there is, there is a parallel. Um, and I think the second part of your question is like, what is the place of theories of gender and feminism within the Palestinian movement for freedom? Like, you know, the thing is, I support Palestine. But what is Palestine? There are so many arguments within Palestinians. So it's which Palestinians do you support? And within Palestine, there are movements that I disagree with. And there are ideas I disagree with. One of which is militant nationalism. You know, I think, I think there's a great danger here. Um, for me, the example is Zionism. Zionism arises out of Europe as a response to European oppression, anti-Semitism. And so in the name of Jewish liberation, they end up in, inadvertently becoming Europeans. They, it's almost like they became the very thing that they were trying to get a, away from. And I think that is a danger for all liberation movements. I don't care if it's Black Lives Matter or Palestine or anything else. We always have the, the risk of replicating the very thing that we claim to be contesting. And if Palestinian resistance takes a militant nationalism, I'm afraid it's actually just mimicking the Zionism it opposes. And that relates to gender, because insofar as militant nationalism is very phallic and masculine, women's voices are dropped, and questions of feminism are seen as secondary to national liberation. Palestinian feminists have been fighting this from the beginning, there's many Palestinian authors, Amal Amira, Isla Jad, people like this who've been writing about it. And they, they've documented what I've said, like in the first intifada, there was this huge grassroots movement of Palestinian women that were organizing. And then almost as a reaction to them, Palestinian society after the first intifada became a bit more aggressively masculine. So yeah, that's my answer to your question. I hope, I hope it was helpful. Sasha, then Ibrahim, Hatem, then Mesa. So Sasha, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, thank you so much um, for, for this great presentation. Um, so I was, I was thinking about um, you talking about this idea of uh, these films as articulating this idea of liberation and perhaps futurity as well. Um, and thinking about the fact that like all art, these are obviously interactive things with audiences. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit about how these films interact with or speak to audiences, both Palestinian audiences, and then if so differently, um, international audiences as well. Yeah, you know, I've, a lot of people have asked me this kind of question and I always have a difficult time answering it. And to be honest, I have actually seen Palestinian directors have a difficult time answering it because they are making their films for so many audiences. I don't think it's fair. For instance, Anne-Marie Jasser, her first film, Salt of the Sea, which I do think is her weakest film, and I do criticize it in the book as much as I do like her. I do criticize it somewhat, um, especially in relation to her next two films. You know, I, I, I have seen Palestinians criticize this film and say it's like a, a film for Westerners. And I don't think that's completely right. I also don't think it's completely wrong. I think she's trying to think, how do I make this film for Westerners? And so sometimes Palestinians in, within West Bank, for instance, they don't like it. But, but it's like a very difficult thing because Palestine is such a global entity as a result of the Nakba and the diaspora. It's like, there's so many perspectives and who do you address these things to? Um, one of the films that I have seen massive audience differences to is, I don't really talk about it in the book, it's Elias Lehmann's film, The Time That Remains. Um, a film that I would actually put in my top 10 film of all time list. It might be the only Palestinian film in my top 10 film of all time list. Elisa Lehmann's The Time That Remains. Um, Suleiman is, he's from Nazareth. He holds an Israeli citizenship. You know, he's born there. Um, and so he's like a 48 Palestinian. And as a result, he grew up seeing Israeli flags, speaking Hebrew, knowing Jews. He's still militantly Palestinian as far as I'm concerned, but when I've seen Palestinians in other places watch that film, they will accuse it of normalizing Israel. And so it's interesting how that film could be seen as so subversive in one context, but then you play it to some Palestinians from the camps in Lebanon, as I have, 
they actually see they are actually quite offended by the film and they think it's normalizing Israel. So, yeah, I mean, I don't have like, once again, I, I don't have like a, a solid answer for you, but um, I also have actually the same question as you do: is how these films communicate with audiences. And the other thing I would say is how do they talk to audiences in the West Bank? There are very few cinemas in the West. There's zero cinemas in Gaza. And there are very few cinemas in the West Bank. There are occasional art film festivals. There are a couple of sites. They don't do well. And from what I gather, they often play whatever Hollywood fare they can, they can get. Uh, occasionally Palestinian films. But I think they circulate there more on like the black market or like hand-to-hand -hand DVD or download than anything else. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Sasha. Um, Raheem is up next. Uh, thank you, Greg, uh, for uh, today's talk. I have a couple of questions and one remark. Sure. Uh, the first question is, do you think if Hanan Sharawi was elected the president uh, of Palestine would have changed the, uh, the attitude from the West having a woman and a Christian woman instead of having the West looking at Palestine being a Muslim, radical, masculine, uh, state, uh, would that have been sympathetic uh, to Palestine having a Hanan Ashrawi, which is a very strong uh, uh, lady, a politician? This is my one question. The second question, I don't know if you have touched on and that, that I missed out. You didn't talk about any of the movies that uh, my Masri have done about Palestine. I don't know if you did or I missed it out. And the second remark, that's not a question, uh, I think the Zionist movement was well before anti-Semitism. So I think that created anti-Semitism, uh, if any. Uh, I think that the Zionist movement was well before where the Jews were prosecuted in, in Europe. Uh, this is a remark of mine. And I, if you have any comment on that, that would be fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so really quickly, um, I've met May Mastri. Um, she came to my class once. I mention her a few times in my book, but I don't subject any of her films like extended analysis. However, you'll be happy to know, I don't have the name in front of me, a book was just released. As far as I know, it's the only book dedicated completely to one single Palestinian director. So there's a new book just released, I think by Paul Grave or maybe Rutledge, just about May Mastri. So that exists. Um, you know, Hanan Ashrawi was just recently denied a visa to visit the United States. So maybe civil society would like her more in some ways, but I'm not sure that alone. Um, I, I, to be honest, I think Palestine could elect Jesus himself, and that wouldn't change the minds of uh, the, Zion, the Christian Zionists and their various lobbies in the United States. So that's what I'd say about that. Although I would welcome her. And Unfortunately, I disagree with you, <laughs> but I mean, it's just a matter of record. Anti-Semitism goes back long before the 19th century, which is when Zionism, to, and to be honest, Zionism really starts in Christian circles before it gets to Jewish circles. Even the phrase that the Zionists use, like a land for a people, for a people without a land, that actually originated in Christian circles before some Jews adopted it in the 19th century. Thank you so much. Um, Hatem, and then we're going to end with Maisa. Hatem, if you want to unmute yourself. So your book wants us to take utopian politics, solidarity, and hope seriously. These are things which, at, for many who uh, see the realities on the ground in Palestine, in the occupation, many who see the realities of white supremacy and its violence in the US, uh, they don't like the word utopia. They don't always like the word hope. How do people typically misunderstand the politics of solidarity, the politics of utopia, and the politics of hope in relation to Palestine and film? What's, if, if there's something you could tell them, here's what you should think about it, or here's what yeah. you should understand about it. Um, it's, it's nice to get a question from one of the people who hired me for this job and then left Lebanon before the crisis. I think you had your finger on something, Hatton. Thank you for the question. Um, let me answer it maybe in a slightly unexpected way by quoting a French guy named Jean-Luc Godard, who, uh, the, the filmmaker, who uh, he has this quote that in 1948 with the Nakba, it's as if the Jews entered fiction 
and the Palestinians entered documentary. And what he means by that is once Israel established itself, the Palestinians have this burden of trying to prove to the world their plight, trying to prove to the world their rights to the land, trying to prove to the world their oppression. Meanwhile, the Israelis are in this fictional world of they have a state and uh, th this belief that they, they control the land and everything else. How that works out cinematically, Palestinians have this great burden to try to convince the world of the justice of their cause, which is why so many Palestinian films, especially like in the militant 70s, are all about bombs and oppression and death and despair and walls and apartheid. But I don't think you're going to, con I, I think the problem with this kind of approach to film is you're preaching to the converted. I don't care how many bombs you document, the people dropping the bombs are gonna keep dropping them. If anything, they'll be proud of what they did. Look at what we did, we dropped all these bombs. So I think there's an ultimate limit to that kind of realist oppression pedagogical documentary. And for Palestinians who have given up on the language of hope and utopia, I think that's a very sad thing because that that fictional world of utopia and magical realism or surrealism, I think that's precisely where Palestinians for themselves can imagine liberation, but it's also in a, just a purely propaganda way, a, a, a wonderful way to convert people to your cause. I think the Israelis have done a very good job of it. Waltz with Bashir was a coup. Um, this playful kind of documentary about the massacre in Shatila. And I think Palestinians can also play with that language, both for their own you know, articulations of liberation, but also for appealing to a much wider um, audience. We certainly see this with like Jordan Peele and Get Out. We see this kind of playful political surrealism, fiction, fantasy with um, Bong Joon-ho and like films like Parasite or The Host. And I think there's, there's definitely room for Palestinians to try to do these kinds of film as well. There's a lot of barriers to it, financially included, but, um, but I think in terms of thinking about hope, solidarity, cinema, that, that is the way to go. Um, we'll take one last question from Mesa. Hi guys, thank you, Greg, it's been really interesting. Um, okay, so apart from more recent filmmakers that you've already mentioned, like Elia Suleiman and Anne-Marie Jassir, et cetera, mm -hmm. are there any classic Palestinian filmmakers or classic Palestinian films that you recommend? Or was there even a Palestin Palestinian film scene historically at all? Okay, so the first Palestinian filmmakers were active before 48, right? So we have this long history, the early 20th century, um, he, I, I can't remember his name. Um, I'm not going. I'll get it wrong. But there was a man who actually was like had a camera. He was doing like newsreel footage, like the 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 visit of a Saudi prince to to Jaffa in Jerusalem. And he'd film it, um, and then the Nakba happened. Yeah, everything was lost. He even had a film studio set up. Mm -hmm. Everything was lost. He turned up 40 years later, working as a plumber here in Shatila Camp in, in Lebanon. Nobody even knew who he was. After 48, and all these films are essentially lost as far as I know, anything before 48. After 48, there's a long period where there's no filmmaking taking place. There's a couple of random, like, Jordanian or Egyptian film that has, like, a Palestinian on the set, but that, that's it. Then in the 60s, you have photo photographic initiatives funded by the PLO, PFLP, DFLP, whatever, um, to try to, like, document the refugees' plight, but also trying to... Try, trying to advertise the liberation movement and that turns into documentary filmmaking throughout the 70s again most of these films are lost because they were stored in beirut and when when israel invaded beirut they went missing now pieces of them exist here and there they're on youtube a wonderful book has just been published by uh, nadia yakub called palestinian cinema in the days of revolution that describes all of these films from the 70s in great detail so to answer your question, all of this history of Palestinian cinema is largely unavailable or just available in snippets here and there or very difficult to find. So the first films that we actually normally talk about come from the 80s mm -hmm. and they're with a, a Palestinian, again from Nazareth, but um, he moved to Belgium. And he, he did a documentary in the early 80s called Fertile Memory. And then he did this fictional film called Wedding in Galilee. And that's like the canonical first independent fictional feature film, Wedding in Galilee. Mm -hmm. 
um, that I would recommend to you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, um, allow me to thank Greg uh, for joining us. This was really, really fantastic. Greg, thanks for sharing uh, your perspective, giving us, shedding a little light on your book. Um, I know you have, before you end, I know you have another, um, you're working on something with our last guest on the conversation series, Saeed uh, Achan. Um, do you know when that's coming out? Um, my essay is done, so I'm done with it. But he's he's okay. editing a book about, um, this is interesting, it's a book about both Palestinian and Israeli film. Now, initially I had hesitations about it because I'm not interested in this kind of Palestine, Israel being equal, but they're anti-Zionist perspectives, and that's actually really interesting, anti-Zionist perspectives on Israeli films. So my essay is about the plight of African asylum seekers in um, 48 Palestine and, and Israel, yeah. and Israeli documentaries about them, and how those documentaries renegotiate Israeli forms of whiteness. He's editing the book at, I think, Stanford or maybe Duke University Press probably next year. Stay in touch, stay curious, stay nerdy. Thanks so much. And Greg, cheers, I really appreciate it.